Amen. So we continue in our series as we've been learning about the names of God and, and learning how God reveals Himself to us through His names. And there are many names for the Lord in, in the Scriptures. And I found one here that you've probably read yourself in, in Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus chapter 34. And in verse 14, the Lord says this. Exodus 34, 14, He says, For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, notice this. He says, whose name is Jealous, with a capital J-E-L-O-U-S. His name is Jealous. This is one of the names that the Lord reveals to us as being His name. His name is Jealous. Right away you start wondering about this um, because jealous does not have a good connotation. I mean, jealous is something that uh, has been kind of looked down upon for the last 30 or 40 years. So I wanted to go back and, and study the, the word and what it exactly means. I went back to the 1828 Webster Dictionary and jealous has a slightly different meaning than envy. See, the problem is there's... Okay, all right, wonderful. So, so we're, we're continuing in our study in, in uh, the names of God as we go through this series. By the way, when we get to the end, I'm going to draw some things on the board, and I want to show you how many names the Lord has through the Scriptures. It's pretty interesting, and how some of them line up. I, I found the... Um, it kind of lines up like a, like a menorah, like one of the candelabras that are used in the, in the Jewish worship services. So we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But right now we're just working through one name at a time. And, and the one name that I found, I'm trying to go in order as we go through the Bible. And one of the names I found here is in Exodus, the second book of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14. And in this particular verse, he reveals another name to us. He says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. The Lord whose name is Jealous with a capital J is a jealous God. Something you would think that wouldn't be very nice for God to be jealous. And yet He is. And the reason we think it might not be very nice is maybe we don't understand the word. Because we may have confused the word jealous with the word envy. There's a lot of confusion in words nowadays in America. Some people think the word uh, prejudice and discrimination are the same word. And they're not. They're two different words. Some people think the words uh, tolerance and acceptance are the same words. And they're not. They're two different words. And some people think jealous and envy are the same words. And they're not. They're two different words. So since the Lord would have us to grow in grace and in knowledge, why don't we find out what the two words mean and see what the difference is? See, jealous, according to the 1828 dictionary, jealous uh, comes, it has the word zeal in there. And for the same type of root word. And it means to be, jealous is to be careful of rivalship. In other words, the Lord is, has, he's, a carefulness is to be full of care. He's, he cares about rivalship. Is to be uh, solicitous to defend the honor of. The Lord wants to defend His honor. So He's a jealous God defending His honor and exactly who He is. It means to be vigilant and concerned for the character of. See, God is a jealous God because He's vigilant. He's always watching. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro. And He's concerned for His character and that it's properly represented down here on earth. God gets misrepresented down here a lot. That's why His name is Jealous and He's a jealous God. Now, envy is different. Envy, the definition, is to feel uneasy, to feel uneasy at the sight of someone who has superior excellence. Now, maybe you've probably felt envy in your life. Maybe like I have as a piano player, and I, I see a better piano player, and then I feel envy because he's a better piano player than I am. Or as a pastor, just about every pastor is better than I am, and I may feel envy. But that's a different thing. See, God doesn't look at anybody and see of anyone who is of superior excellence to him. God doesn't have envy about anyone. There's no one like our glorious God. And so, he doesn't have that. Envy is to grudge or to hold maliciously someone because of their talents. God doesn't grudge or hold anyone in malice because of their talents. Because if you summed all the talents of every being in the universe together, it would be like a thimble full of, of talent compared to the ocean that God has. God isn't envious of anyone, but He is concerned about His character. And He's vigilant about His character. And I want to show you that 
uh, that God's jealousy is a good jealousy. And I want to show you three aspects of God's jealousy from the Scriptures today. We're going to let the Scriptures reveal what this name is about. Augustine once said, He that is not jealous is not in love. And we know that God is love. And so God is jealous and His name is jealous. And He marks that right out. The Lord is jealous. By the way, that's just one thing I just want to quickly, before we get into the message, just show you as an aside. There are a group of people that run around that have a, a New World translation of the Bible. And they sometimes come to doors and knock on the doors and they want you to get involved in their teaching. And they're called Jehovah's Witnesses. They're out there witnessing for Jehovah which is an interesting concept to me, seeing that we're in the New Testament and the Lord's name in the New Testament, we're studying Old Testament names, but in the New Testament, His name is Jesus. There's none other name given among men under heaven whereby somebody must be saved. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It's the name of Jesus that's to be lifted up today. I don't understand why they're doing this after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, I might understand if they're running around witnessing for Jehovah. But they'll insist that Jehovah is the only name of God. And yet, he just told you his name is Jealous. Mm -hmm. Now, usually the verse they'll use to tell you that is they'll, go, they'll run to Psalm 83. Have you ever looked at Psalm 83 and see the verse they'll use? This is one of the ones they'll use at the end. I just want to straighten this out before we get into the message. In Psalm 83 and verse 18, they'll use this verse all the time. And they'll say um, that men may know, Psalm 83, 18, that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, all caps, are the Most High over all the earth. And they'll look at that particular verse and they say, did you see that verse? Did you see what that verse said? That verse said God's name alone is Jehovah. That's, that's not what... I mean, it says that, but think of it. It didn't say His only name is Jehovah. It said His name alone is Jehovah. In other words, He's the only one in the universe that has the name Jehovah. I, I've never met anybody with that name of you. Okay? I've never met anybody named their kid Jehovah. I never have. And, and, and God's name alone, He's the only person to possess that name, but it's not His only name. He has more than one name. It just happens to be His name alone. Think of it like this. Um, if, if there were only one uh, silver cloud vintage 1930 Rolls Royce left on the planet, okay? And that, and that Rolls Royce was in the garage of a man that collected cars. All right? And whoever that man is, he says, that, that is my Rolls Royce alone. That's correct. Nobody else has it. It's his. But it's not his only car. He's got a Mercedes over there. He's got a Porsche over there. Has, God is the same way. God has many names, but that name happens to be his alone. And we just saw in Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, he just told you his name is Jealous. His name is Jealous. By the way, you might want to remember that. You might want to mark that down in your Bible in Psalm 83, verse 18, in case someone comes to your door, and then ask them to turn in their own Bible, the New World Translation, to uh, Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14, and what they'll be able to read is, you must not prostrate yourself to another god, because Jehovah, whose name is, capital J-E-A-L-O-U-S, he is a jealous god. In their own translation, it says that God's name is Jealous. So you might want to let them look at their own thing and try and figure out what's going on. Maybe God has more than one name, which He does, which is why we're studying the names of God. And He's got a new name in the New Testament, which is Jesus. But it's something for them to think about. But I just wanted to show you that before we move on in the message. And the message is the Lord is jealous. Jealous for what? I'm going to show you three things that He's jealous for. Turn back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. If you had a pew Bible, it would be found uh, on page 70. But back in Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, look at the first six verses. Here is the Lord on Mount Sinai coming down, uh, hovering over the mountain and giving the Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity 
of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Notice what God is jealous about. You know what He's jealous about right here in this passage? He's jealous for true worship. He's jealous for true worship. What was He doing with these people? He was taking the Israelites out of a land where there was a plethora of false gods. He was taking them out of the house of bondage, He says in verse number 2. Over there, they worshipped all kinds of gods in Egypt. And he says, I'm taking you out of the bondage of false religion and I'm bringing you into the covenant of true worship and true religion with I, the Lord God. That's what he's teaching them. And he says, and I'm jealous for this. There are no other gods. You shall have no other gods. I want true worship. God was explaining to these people, what you've learned in Egypt is false. And I want you to put it behind you, leave it behind you, forget it, turn from it, never look back, and turn unto me, and look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved, for I am the Lord. I am the Lord thy God. There are no other gods. God is jealous. He's concerned and vigilant for true worship. Back in Egypt... And if you were to turn back in, in Exodus chapter 12, I'll show you. But back in Egypt, they had... I just named some of the gods that they had back in Egypt. They had the god for fertility, who was in the form of a bull. And was Apis. And they would have these statues of the bulls, and they would get down, and they would bow down to these statues of bulls. They had made something like unto the earth. He said, Thou shalt make no image of anything that's in heaven above or that's in earth beneath. And here they are making things that creep on the earth. They had um, Hathor, which is the goddess of love uh, and the goddess of dance and the goddess of alcohol. And she was in the form of a cow. They had um, Hecate. Hecate was the primordial goddess of things that come from the earth and she was in the form of a frog. They had the sky god, Horus that was in the form of a falcon. They had um, the goddess of life and healing that was Isis, and Osiris was the ruler of the dead. And here's what God said in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12 about all these gods in Egypt. He says in Exodus 12:12, 12, 12, He tells the Israelites, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. God is jealous for true worship. He does not like false religion. He does not like to see His creatures in His likeness and image, that's man, bowing down to other things that creep upon the earth and having false gods before Him. Matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 18... And verse 11, when Jethro heard the report of what had happened back there in Egypt and Moses told him what had happened, he said to his father-in-law, then Jethro said in, in uh, Exodus, go to the 10th verse. And then we'll look at the 11th. We'll look at 10 and 11. 18, 10 and 11. Blessed be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. You know, it takes pride to come up with false gods and to make statues and images to them and then to come up with all these myths and fables about what these gods are able to do because that's the imagination of men. How could you possibly think that a frog or a cow or a bull is going to give you fertility? That's the, the vain and wicked imagination of men. And you know what's so sad? As you read through the Scriptures, here God is saying, I've, I've taught you not to have these images. I'm the one that delivered you. I am a jealous God. My name is jealous. Remember this about me. As you go through the history of God's people, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, you will find that they turned to false gods in the Old Testament. One by one, they fell away to false gods. When they got into Canaan, there was the Canaanite master lord called Baal. And you'll find... You'll f turn to the book of Judges. I'll give you an example. Turn to Judges, chapter 2. Go to the right a few books. You'll find after Joshua, there's Deuteronomy, there's Joshua, there's Judges. And Judges, chapter 2. And when you get there, you'll look at verses 11 and 12. 
Judges 2, 11, and 12. And here are God's people. After God had told them, after God had delivered them, after God had brought judgment on all the false gods, and the people get into the promised land, and here's what happens. Verse 11, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Baalim. Now, Baal was the master lord Canaanite god. And I am is a plural. In other words, they not only had Baal, but they had Baal Bereth. And they had Baal Peor. And they had all these kind of Baal Hazor. And they had all kinds of, uh, I don't know, progeny of Baal. And they had multiple Baals. One wasn't enough for them. And they had not only Baal, but they had false Baals. And Baal was false himself. You'll find later on in some of the books that they were worshipping the Philistine fish god, Dagon. And you read that story later on in... Uh, I can't remember where that is. I think it's in 1 Samuel. You'll read that story. They, they, they turned to the Ammonite fire god, which was Molech, also known as Malcolm. They were, started worshipping the fertility goddess known as Ashtaroth. Matter of fact, Judges chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. And this really infuriates God when people start praying to female gods and goddesses because the Lord happens to be male. <laughs> He's Father God, our Father which art in heaven. Jesus is male. He was a man. Behold the man. And the Holy Spirit is the male spirit of God. And, and, then, and now this Ashtaroth comes on the scene in Judges chapter 10 and uh, verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Baalim and Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistine, and they forsook the Lord, and they served Him not. There was Tammuz, the shepherd god of spring vegetation that they would weep for in the book of Ezekiel, and they're serving all these false gods, and God is jealous for true worship. God is jealous for true worship. He wants true worship. That's what God's jealous for. And you know, the funny thing is, man's history is replete with false gods. As you go on and you continue, you get to the Greeks, and they had their Greek mythological gods. And they still study them in university today. And then the Romans came along with their mythological gods, Jupiter and Mars and Neptune. Matter of fact, in the book of Acts, you'll see people thought that Paul and Barnabas were Jupiter and, and Mars. And, and, and then you get to uh, Norse mythology with Thor. And, and then there are religions full of, of, of false gods and false deities. As a matter of fact, I, I have a book here and on pages 25 and 26 going through here you have the idea of gods associated with certain occupations and certain days has continued not through Greek and Roman and, and Norse mythology but even into the Roman Catholic Church where they have beliefs in saints and in saints days. And he has listed here 43 different saints that people pray to based on their occupation. For example, if you're a, uh, a carpenter, uh, if you're a comedian, you pray to St. Vitus. If you're a candle maker, you pray to St. Bernard. If you're a fisherman, you pray to St. Andrew. If you're a housekeeper, pray to St. Anne. If you're a hat maker, pray to St. James. If you, if you do plaster for a living, pray to St. Bartholomew. And then going on, they have saints for, if you're a barren woman, pray to St. Anthony. If you drink beer, pray to St. Nicholas. If, you, if you're a child, pray, honest to goodness, pray to St. Dominic. Domestic am, animals are to pray to St. Anthony. I don't know how they can do that. If you're an immigrant, you pray to St. Francis. If you're a lover, pray to St. Raphael. If you're an old maid, pray to St. Andrew. If you're poor, pray to St. Lawrence. Pregnant women, pray to St. Gerard. Uh, if, if you've been uh, all kinds, if you have all kinds of maladies, if you've got arthritis, pray to St. James. If you've been bitten by a dog, pray to St. Hubert. Bitten by a snake, pray to St. Hilary. If you're blind, pray to St. Raphael. If you're deaf, pray to St. Kadok. I'll tell you, St. Kadok's as deaf as you are. He can't hear you either. Amen. And people are praying to these things. And you want to know something? Let me just show you what God thinks about saints and praying to saints. Turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 15 and verse 15. Easy to remember. 15, 15. Job 15, 15. In this particular chapter, God's talking that He's not that impressed with men. We'll never make it. <laughs> We're not that impressed with men. So let me just show you that uh, what God, God thinks in Job 15. 
in, 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 in 14, he just asks this question. What is man that he should be clean, which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous? Verse 15, Behold, he, God, putteth no trust in his saints. God puts no trust in his saints. Amen. Why? They're men. They're not righteous. Amen. They're men. They're not clean. Yeah, the heavens are not clean in his sight. You think a dirty, filthy man is something to pray to? God is interested and jealous for true worship. Amen. And he doesn't like false worship and praying to saints and gods and to women like Mary. Mary. People pray to Mary. You know, in the Bible, in the entire Bible, there's only 19 verses with Mary's name in it. I'm talking Mary, the mother of Jesus. There are only 19 verses. There's more than twice as many about Herod. Count them sometime. Mary's not important. Herod's not important. No one's, you know who's important? You're supposed to pray to God. I can show you over 20 verses in the Psalms alone that you're only to pray to God. Turn, turn to the next book after Job, Psalms. Turn to Psalm 32. I'll show you three. You can find the rest in your own readings. Go to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. God is jealous for true worship. Your prayers are, are to be directed to Him. Your praise is to be toward Him. Your worship is to be of Him. And you want to get to know anybody, you want to get to know Him through reading the Bible. God is jealous of true worship. In Psalm 32, and look at uh, verse uh, 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee. Talking about the Lord. You godly, you pray unto God. You don't pray to Mary. You godly, you pray unto God. You don't pray to saints. You godly, you pray unto God. You don't pray unto Moses. You don't pray unto the apostles. You don't pray unto the Roman gods, the Greek gods, the Old Testament false gods. God is jealous for true worship. He's jealous for true worship. Go to Psalm 42. I'll show you two more verses. Psalm 42. Look at verse 8. The psalmist says in Psalm 42, 8, Yet the Lord will command His loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night His song shall be with me, and my prayer unto the God of my life. Who alone can hear prayer? If you're godly, you pray unto God. Who can hear prayer? Only God can hear prayer. Go to Psalm 62 or 65 and verse 2. Psalm 65, verse 2. There's over there's 20 verses like this. I'm just showing you three. Psalm 65 and verse 2. He talks, the psalmist says, that praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, verse 1. Unto thee shall the vow be performed. Unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. God's jealous for true worship. He is not pleased with this false religiosity going on out there. I was taking care of a man the other day at the hospital. He says, well, you know, I believe in God and you can call Him whatever you want. Uh, some people call Him a God. Some people call Him the Lord. Some people pray to Jesus. Some people pray to Allah. I said, let me tell you something. God is jealous for His name. He knows who He is. He's written an autobiography. If you'll read it, you'll find out who He is. He'll give you His name and it's not Allah. And it's not Mary, and it's not Aloysius, and it's not Baal, and it's not Ashtaroth, and it's not Tammuz, and it's not Jupiter. It's the Lord thy God, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. And that's who hears prayer, and that's who you're to come to. He's jealous for true worship. Let me show you another thing he's jealous for. Go back to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. And we'll let the tape roll. <laughs> Exodus 34. Where we started and we learned his name is Jealous. Well, that particular phrase is found in the midst of a number of verses that begin in verse 12 and run all the way to verse 16. If you look carefully, at the end of 12, there's no period. At the end of 13, there's no period. At the end of 14, there's no period. And at the end of 15, there's no period. And at the end of 16, there's a period. That entire passage is one phrase that God wants to get across. So let's pick it up in verse 12. He says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. And boy, the day's coming when all this false idolatry and these statues and these false temples and false churches are going to be broken down by Jesus and His army when they come back to planet Earth because these commandments are going to be fulfilled. Every jot and tittle shall be fulfilled when Jesus is here. 
And that's going to happen. Verse 14, For thou shalt worship no other god, little g, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God, capital G. And watch this. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons. And their daughters go a-whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. You know what, you know what else God's jealous for besides true, true worship? Let me tell you. He is jealous for His covenant of marriage. Because marriage was ordained by God in the Garden of Eden before man fell. And it's not good for the man to be alone. And God is jealous for His covenant of marriage. Not the world's idea of marriage where they're giving in marriage and marrying and eating and drinking, but God's true covenant of marriage. Because God understands that our relationship with God, if you have the Lord on high... And that relationship to one of us. And then we have a spouse. He understands that there's a magnetic attraction that goes on. And this spouse has the ability to draw us away from the true relationship and the true worship with the true God. And that's happened time and time again throughout the Scriptures and throughout human history. Matter of fact, uh, after Exodus, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. He says, Don't take their daughters to thy sons, lest they go a whoring after their gods and draw your sons away. Deuteronomy chapter 7. When they entered the land, verse 1, just to show you where you are, Deuteronomy 7, 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, here's what you should do. Verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, the people in the land. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. And you know what the jealous gods? So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. God is jealous for His name. He is jealous for true worship. And, and with jealousy comes righteous wrath and righteous anger. And God's letting you know this. He understands that people can be drawn away by their spouse. And He's jealous for this covenant. And He says, if you haven't been married, you better be very careful who you're picking for a partner. Because even good men can be drawn away. Even good women can be drawn away. Don't you go looking for your spouse, for your significant other. Don't you go looking for a mate in the world. You, find, you let God help you find your mate. You let God lead you to that person. And then you make sure that person is a believer in the God that you worship with true worship because God is jealous over that thing. And this has happened time and time again in the Scriptures. Let me show you an example. Um, there's a book called Nehemiah. After the great books of history of Samuel's and, and Chronicle and Kings, there's a couple books. There's Ezra and there's Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah was observing this happening in the land of Israel that the priests were being drawn away and marrying pagan women. And Nehemiah had this to say. Nehemiah said this uh, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 25. Nehemiah was, was jealous for true worship. He loved the Lord. He had a zeal for God. And he said, And I contended with them, and I cursed them, and I smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons. Don't you take a Jewish daughter and give it to a pagan son. Nor take their daughters, a pagan daughter, unto a Jewish son. Don't you do this. What? Verse 26, Did not Solomon, the king of Israel, sin by these things? Now, Solomon was a great man in God's sight. 
Solomon was the son of David. Solomon was someone that God met with personally and gave him wisdom from on high. And Solomon was blessed to rule over the united kingdom of Israel with Judah and Israel together. And yet even if Solomon was drawn away, he, w he sinned by making relationships with women from other countries and having concubines and wives. Uh, verse 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. What does that mean? These are women from outside the land of Israel. Women from other lands, women with other religions, other gods came and they caused Solomon to sin. Even a good man, even someone that loves the Lord, a born-again Christian can be drunk. away from true worship of the true God when this marriage covenant, God's marriage covenant, is entered into with a wrong heart and in the wrong manner. And God is jealous for this thing. God is jealous and rightly so. And rightly so. He's jealous for the covenant of marriage. So, so what's God's advice to you and to me? Well, first commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength. And then the second is to love others like yourself. You want to love your spouse like you love yourself. But you want to make sure that spouse also loves the Lord. Because when the spouse loves the Lord, instead of drawing you away as you're getting closer to the Lord and the spouse is getting closer to the Lord, both of you get closer to each other and closer to the Lord. And it strengthens that. And so the Lord's recommendation is given by Paul the Apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. God is jealous. He's, he's concerned. He's vigilant. He's protecting His character and His covenant. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And in verse 39, the Apostle says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married. She can get remarried. To whom she will? Only in the Lord. She'd better marry a believer. And that applies across the board. Matter of fact, in the next book, Paul maybe felt he didn't get it across strongly enough in the first epistle. So in the second epistle in chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he just wants to come out and make sure that everybody gets it. Because you know how people are funny? People might look at that verse and go, well, that applies to the women, but doesn't apply to the men. <laughs> We're funny that way. Well, that, he said, talking to a woman, yeah, if a woman's going to get remarried, she's got to get remarried in the Lord, but didn't say anything about me in my first marriage, and she's awfully good looking, and I'll get her converted. Don't bet on it. Don't you try on relationship evangelism. That's not going to work. Let me show you. Here's what Paul says, just to make it plain and clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Be ye, male or female, plural, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ who's in you with Belial or Baal or the devil that's in the other one? What part hath he that believeth? What an infidel. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. He's jealous for this true covenant of marriage. This is, again, he's speaking to people who aren't yet married. He's trying to reach young people out there. Or people who have been married and someone died or there was a divorce and now they're alone and they're, they're loving the Lord and they're thinking, I might want to enter into another relationship because it's not good that the man should be alone. God understands it. 99% of people are going to get married. But God says, when you're out there looking, you remember, maintain my covenant of marriage and don't take an unbeliever for a mate. And you know what? You show God that that's what you want to do and God will lead the desire of you to the, to the desire of your heart. He'll have someone out there for you. You just wait on the Lord and He'll bring it to pass. He's jealous for that. He's jealous for that. But let me show you the third thing God's jealous for. Uh, turn back to a small epistle, a small book in the Old Testament called the Book of Nahum. After Daniel, there are seven minor prophets and this is, there are 12 minor prophets. This is number 7. 
the book of Nahum. I'll show you another thing God is jealous for. He's jealous for true worship. And then He's jealous for you to have the right covenant of marriage. But one other thing He's jealous for, Nahum tells the people of Nineveh. In Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, the burden of Nineveh, Nineveh's unbelievers, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. You know what else God is jealous for? He's jealous for His people. And He makes a real distinction between His people and His enemies. And God has enemies. And He's got it. The enemies are over here. And he makes a difference. God is jealous for his people. He doesn't have any jealousy for his enemies. He's jealous for his people. And it tells you right here that God is going to revenge and take vengeance on his adversaries with his wrath in fury. In fury. God is powerful and he's jealous and watch out when he exercises that. And I'll tell you something. God's people... Through the history of mankind. You can go get history books anywhere and read them. God's people. His physical people of the Old Testament, the Jews. His spiritual people of the New Testament, the Christians. The body of Christ. The born-again believers. The born-again children of God. Not, not people that go to church. Not people that, that call themselves Christians but have never received Jesus Christ in their heart. But those who have been born of the Spirit. Born of God. His people have suffered at the hands of unbelievers. They have suffered reproach. They have suffered smiting. They have suffered scourging. They have suffered stoning. They have suffered hanging. They have suffered the sword. They have suffered gassing. They have suffered imprisonment. They have been despised and persecuted by the world. And God is jealous over that thing. And He never asked us to lift a hand or a sword or to speak back because He is going to be the divine avenger. And he's jealous. Matter of fact, turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, in the New Testament. We'll go back to Nahum later, but I'll show you in Hebrews, chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews, chapter 11, is the, the chapter of faith. And we learn of people that love God in this chapter, people that are God's people. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him, but these people have pleased Him, and they're His people, and He's jealous for them. He's jealous for them. And then He watches how the world treats His people, starting in verse 35. Now, he, he, this is verse going to split in two. First, the good news. Women receive their dead raised to life again. I'm talking about all the good things God has done. And then watch what the wicked have done. And then the, semi, or the colon there. And others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. That was, that's a rough way to die. Yes. You're talking about little pebbles from a rock garden. You're talking about men lifting a boulder about as heavy as they can and throwing it on you. And then you falling down and having these large 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 pound weights smash against your head and against your shoulders, against your hips, against your rib cage, crushing you and killing you. They were stoned. That's a rough way to die. They were stoned. Verse 7. They were sawn asunder. Sawing limbs off. Sawing heads off. Beheading people. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. Think of the history of Islam. One of their symbols is a sword, a material sword. Read a World Book Encyclopedia. Read the Encyclopedia Britannica. This is common knowledge out there. Go to Barnes & Noble and ask for the history and read it. Song with the sword, Christians. Verse 37, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. In God's eyes, the world wasn't even worthy of His people. They're persecuting His people and they have all the money and they have all the power and the, and the, and the small people are despised and God says, you're not even worthy of My people. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. 
And God is jealous for His people. And so you know what's going to happen? He told you in the book of Nahum that He has reserved His wrath for those who have persecuted His people. He's reserving it. He's long-suffering, but it's building up. The cup of wrath is being filled slowly but surely. And the day is going to come and God's going to pour out the seals and the trumpets and the vials of His wrath upon the earth. Back in the book of Nahum, where we were originally, He said how He's reserving His wrath for His enemies. You know, and this is, a, this is something that people don't want to understand. People are being sold a bill of goods about the true God who wants true worship. They're sold a bill of goods in believing that there's false gods and you can come any way you want to God and you can't. You have to come His way. Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and life. They, they believe that they can go out and have any covenant of marriage they want. Marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce. Or, or, or men marrying men or women marrying women or, or one guy marrying 15 women and polygamy. And they have all these concepts and God is jealous of these things. And then they take His people and they persecute His people and God is jealous and He's going to defend His character and His name in all these three areas when He comes back. And He says in Nahum that He's jealous and He revengeth, the Lord revengeth. He is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on all His adversaries. He reserveth wrath for His enemies. And then, and then in the book behind it, go back to the book behind Nahum, to Micah. And look at Micah, verse 515. And then I'll give you some homework to do. You can read on your own. But look at, look at, Na look at Micah, chapter 5, and verse 15. And the Lord says, And I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. And you know what? We've heard a lot of things down here in this world. Between magazine and newspaper and television, we hear a lot of things down here. We're at a point, uh, we're, we're almost unshockable. Just the other day, I saw that some young boy, I don't know, 14 years old, walked into a school with three loaded guns and shot the principal in front of everyone else and then and then killed himself and you know it's so matter of fact now nobody batted an eye oh you mean only shot one person that was pretty good well that's good and only one person got killed and then he committed suicide and that, it, we're at the point where we're beyond shocking I mean we've heard it all God says I'm going to execute vengeance and anger and fury on you such you have not heard you've got no idea what the jealous God is going to do when he comes back and executes vengeance and anger. You want to read some other verses? Do it for homework. Isaiah 66, verse 16. Isaiah 66, 16. I'll give you another one. Psalm 110, verse uh, 5 and 6. And there's another one off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember. What is it Psalm 137? I can't remember. There was another one that... Uh, I'll pull it out. I'll give it to you for homework or something. You read it sometime. Yeah, Psalm 137. Wait till you get to the, uh, the eighth and ninth verse. You get a bit real, you'll find out what God's going to do. This is the true God of the Bible. This is the one who's jealous about His name and His reputation and the truth about Him. Now the question is this. As I close, the question is this. Now that we've learned God's jealous for true worship, He's jealous for His covenant of marriage, He's jealous for His people, the question is, on which side of the bloodline are you going to be? Are you going to be one of His people or are you going to be one of His enemies? Because this is a personal question. This is an individual question. There's no escaping this. Everyone's going to get the opportunity to stand in line and to take his choice. You can't wash your hands of this like, like, like Pilate did. Are you going to be one of his people for whom the Lord is jealous? Or are you going to be one of his enemies for whom the Lord reserves wrath and vengeance in fury and anger? It's your choice. And let me show you how simple it is. Go to John chapter 3. Go to John chapter 3. Jesus had taught Nicodemus, a man who thought he knew true worship. And Jesus taught him about true worship in spirit and truth. And then, he, and, then, and then at the end of this chapter, John the Baptist and the Apostle John agreed, saying this at the end of the chapter, John 3 and verse 35 and 36. You want to know the truth? You want to know about God jealous for His truth? Here's the truth. John 3.35, The Father loveth His Son. The Father loveth His Son and hath given all things into His hand. It's in Jesus that all the riches of wisdom, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily is dwelling in Jesus. All things 
are given into Jesus' hand. Verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. You're one of His people. Right here, John 3, 36. He that believeth. Then you have all things. And then God is jealous for you. And God's watching out for you. But what about the rest of that verse? And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Believeth not one of the enemies. One of God's enemies. You know what's on you? God's wrath. Spiritually right now. Physically someday in the future. God's jealous. You know what He'd like? He so loved you that while you were yet a sinner, He sent His Son, commended His love, committed His love to have His Son die in your place. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth, whosoever, that's anybody, fill your name in. I'm glad that verse doesn't say that, that Mike Caesar, if Mike Caesar believeth. Why? There might be another Mike Caesar on the planet. It might not be me. But I'm a whosoever, and you're a whosoever. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believeth. Be one of his people. Be under the watchful eye with the un everlasting arms underneath you of a jealous God that's jealous for his character, for true worship, for his covenant, for his people. Choose you today whom you will serve. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for revealing to us the names that You've given Yourself in the Scripture. There are more than one name. You're a great God with many great names. But here in the New Testament, the name of Jesus is lifted above all. Thank You that You are a jealous God and You're jealous and You love Your Son and You have a jealousy for those that love Your Son and receive Him. Help anyone today that's heard the message to open their heart to Jesus Christ so they too may be one of Your people of whom You're jealous. Thank you for this message. Press it on hearts now, I pray, by thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.